Okay, and now I'll go into uh, formal introductions. So uh, my name is Jana Mirson. I am the president of the um, Canadian Association of Seed Research. This is our third round table starting from September, you know, um, that we organize. And um, the re reason we're running this uh, round tables is to kind of keep people in touch, you know, uh, during the times of COVID, you know, so uh, to um, keep the sense of community as much as we can. Um, so we always begin with the acknowledgements uh, of the land, you know, so despite the fact that we are in this uh, virtual space, so I'm in Ottawa, and Ottawa is situated at the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. Uh, so, and I would invite um, everybody uh, to um, uh, type the acknowledgements in the chat section. Um, so uh, this panel is uh, dedicated to research, uh, to the question of how do we do research during the global pandemic, where we are, if it's possible to do research, um, how, what kind of obstacles we, um, uh, we fear, we meet, you know, uh, today, you know, and what kind of advantages, you know, we might have actually, because, uh, Paradoxically, some of us did benefit, you know, from being, um, you know, in, in this isolation uh, for different reasons. Um, so I invited four guests, um, which are very differently located in Canada and in North America in general. And but and and I also am very excited, you know, for because the. Um, expertise is very, very different to each other. So we will we'll begin with um, Nicole Nolet, um, who is um, right now teaches and uh, holds the uh, Canada Research Chair in Minority Studies at the Department of French Studies at the University of Waterloo. Um, and I know that Nicole was working on translation, so that's going to be a very um, particular uh, um, moment of exchange. Um, then I'll um, ask Marjan Musavi, you know, who is now at the University of Maryland uh, to talk about her research. And I know that you working, were working before on the um, political seat in Iran, right, Mar Marjan? So it's really, um, I'm really curious to know how you able to continue this kind of research today um, and how it uh, unfolds on your site. Um, and then we uh, will uh, turn to Professor Siwan Liu uh, from the University of British Columbia, who is a specialist on Asian theater. And again, the same question, how do you do research on Ch China or Japan, you know, today, you know, so from Vancouver, is it still possible? And the uh, our final speaker is Mash, Ash Makalski, you know, who's specialist in disability theater, and uh, she's now at Guelph, right? You know, so holding a postdoctoral um, um, position. And uh, again, you know, so it's a different area of research that I'm sure have been affected, you know, by by the situation. So I, will, I would like to see how things are going, you know. So, um, and what I did, I asked every uh, participant to sort of give a little intervention, a very small summary of very simple things, like what they, uh, three kind of steps, you know. So the first one would be, this is my research, what I used to do, like a bit of a uh, conversation about the past. And then um, kind of three yes, three no's, three possibilities, three not possibilities of what people were able to do, you know, um, during this time. And then kind of, you know, go into maybe future plans, ideas, hopes, uh, suggestions, and so on. And then we will basically open up this to everybody else. Um, yeah. And yes, the most important point, you know, so, um, which I forgot, I'm, I apologize. We have Frederic um, uh, Guerre here, uh, who will be helping us with uh, French translations, you know, so um, we will speak in English. And thank you, Nicole, for accepting this, um, being very kind and speaking in English. Uh, um, and, and Frederic, you know, will be um, doing summaries in French, you know, uh, in the uh, closed captioning, you know. All right, so um, I think we're ready to begin. Um, so, um, Nicole, I would be extremely happy if you probably started. Yeah, if you have, if you're ready to do that. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Yana. Et merci, Frederic, de soustraire uh, cette intervention. 
Um, je, I am going to speak in English, um, maybe a little slowly, so that uh, Frédéric can sum up some of what I'm saying in French in the captions. Um, hi, Yuri. Hi, Yuri. Uh, <laughs> so I will talk a little bit about uh, my research and how it's been going. I, um, I have four main things that I'm doing right now. The biggest of which is uh, supposed to be my uh, my book. Um, I should say that I'm uh, in a very privileged position. I have uh, no dependents except for my cat, and I uh, I'm on an early sabbatical, a junior sabbatical, to prepare for uh, my tenure application, and so I am not teaching online at the moment. I uh, have most of my time to focus on research, and a big pile of service. Uh, and this can be this can go into one of the questions that I'd like to ask my fellow colleagues is about how to how to, how to push away service so that it doesn't take all my research time. Um, so my big, biggest project is my book, um, and um, I am I was supposed to be consulting archives, official archives at uh, uh, the University of Guelph and the. Uh, Canadian Queer Archives in Toronto and the Canadian Film Centre Archives in Toronto as well. And these are all places that shut down in, uh, in March. I have been reaching out to people and trying to get uh, um, documents and any, any kind of thing that I uh, can to sort of fill in some of the holes in the, in the translation theatre history that I am writing but it has been uh, a struggle and one of the things that I've uh, learned to accept so far is uh, uh, that there will be holes uh, up until I can go to those places and uh, the, the information that I'm generating is probably going to shift as well. Um, the second project that I uh, am working on now is um, a survey-based uh, qualitative and quantitative uh, research on the use of digital tools in uh, French Canadian theaters outside Quebec. And I'm working with uh, Frédéric on this project actually. And uh, we were just putting out our, our survey in, uh, in March when everything shut down. And uh, the last thing that people wanted to do was fill out uh, a survey. Um, on the other hand, there has been a lot more interest in digital tools in the theaters since uh, since this happened, and so um, I think I think there will be more research and more more pertinence to this uh, research actually as uh, as we go. Um, and uh, the the other big thing that occupied me, especially in the beginning of the. Uh, of the pandemic was, as you might know, the CATR conference and its organization. And I'm sure Ash can talk to this a bit more as well. Uh, it's a bit of a service job also, but it's also generative for research. And um, it ended up taking a whole bunch of time uh, at the beginning of my sabbatical and in the, the early months of this, uh, the, this situation. Um, and finally, uh, one of the things that I did have to do uh, to uh, when when the situation happened was that uh, some of my students lost their prospective funding for the summer and their prospective jobs, and so I ended up hiring more people to uh, to work on several smaller projects that I had uh, that I didn't intend to do. So um, I'd say that my funds are running lower than usual because I'm trying to support people in this situation as well. Um, so uh, things to do. Uh, I put writing cafes here. Uh, the University of Waterloo has uh, um, many writing cafes during the week and I've been participating at least three times a week in writing cafes because I'm I'm very much a social writer. I, uh, I work when uh, there's a, 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 a carrot at the end of the stick. And uh, so that has been very useful. Uh, the Pomodoro technique has been very useful to get writing. Uh, and accountability meetings uh, every week as well have been uh, extremely, extremely useful as, uh, as we're all home and could be doing many other things than writing research. I'll let someone in here. Here we go. Um, 
and and I'm taking my weekends off. Yes, I'm not working on weekends, which is uh, which. Yes, <laughs> yes. So I'll, uh, the questions that I have for my my colleagues in this panel are about uh, service and about trying to keep some uh, some time for research when uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, service work. Well, thank you, Nicole, you know, so, um, and it's interesting, you know, this question comes from the president of SCAT, you know, so <laughs> about service, you know, so, um, oh, God, we will come back to that, you know, so the, the question of service, you know, I have a feeling that everybody, you know, around the Zoom has things to say about service, especially this year. Um, but I really, uh, what I found really interesting here, are like two things you mentioned, you know, the data, the, um, you know, this, the, how, it, it's always a question of how do we face, um, you know, this whole question of like, you know, at what point do you stop your research and at what point are, do you feel comfortable with the data that you found and how do you accept uh, these gaps, you know, so um, the, to me, this is probably the biggest, you know, the, the fear, you know, that, that I think, you know, we are kind of, you know, facing right now, like, you know, like I would say. Um, well, um, well, thank you so much. Um, I would now go to Marjan, you know, so and ask her to um, share her uh, thoughts with us as well, you know, so yeah, thank you. Sure. Um, so hello, everybody, again, uh, it's a pleasure to be among you. Um, well, since the beginning of this academy here, I have had limited time for research since my teaching responsibilities are more and I spent um, much time getting familiar with the you know, various digital tools for teaching and designing methods for keeping students engaged during the synchronous classes. So that's one of my biggest concerns, which is a kind of research actually. Um, Talking about my research throughout uh, the summer and during the pandemic, I should say that since I taught the course Middle Eastern Theater in 2018, I've been thinking about um, how we can draw the attention of our colleagues and departments to the fact that Middle Eastern Theater can play a significant role in structuring the production of knowledge within the context of our departments or universities. In mid-March, right before the pandemic lockdown began, I tried to spark the conversation digitally by tossing a simple question to the heads of the theater departments in 15 universities in Canada. I did a brief inquiry via email about the historical and pedagogical um, trajectory of the Middle Eastern or West Asian theater in their curricula or the, in their events um, in their department. Uh, in the email that uh, I sent, I asked whether this topic has ever been offered as a course in their department, and half of the departments responded, and some even showed um, interest in continuing the conversation. But unfortunately, the whole project went on halt due to the lockdown. Um, and as Nicole said, I guess the last thing people wanted to do <laughs> at the end of March was uh, answering uh, these questions. So um, I did not send follow-up email to those departments, but took my questions and the email responses to a round table on pedagogy and absence at ATA conference, uh, which was online in August. Uh, the transcribed version of the round table will be published in the next issue of Theater Topics. So um, in a sense, the round table had actually, when we did it online um, and um, the result is something satisfactory and the round table, you know, the, the format of round table, how generative it could be. Um, um, so I decided to explore uh, this topic in another front in April um, and right at the beginning of the pandemic while we were receiving the news about, you know, the news that our dear COVID-19 is going to stay with us. Uh, for some time. Uh, at that time, I decided to create a digital database that uh, collects and shares the essential information of the most significant plays that have been produced in the region and its diasporas since 2000. Uh, the goal behind making this digital guide is to offer it to theater companies and professors, hoping they choose plays from the contemporary Middle East in their companies, performance season, or in their you know, course syllabi. Um, 
So at the, at the beginning, um, I was not sure about the kind of response that I would receive. So I began sending emails to people in my own network, both in North America and the MENA region, uh, Middle East and North Africa, and invited them to complete a Google form that I had created. Um, within a matter of two months, uh, I was connected to more than 50 scholars, artists, and critics in 12 countries in the Middle East region. And uh, in the uh, and as I said, in, during the, uh, those two months, I received 120 completed forms from these critics and um, artists, and also experts, you know, professors uh, at the university at different universities in Turkey, in Tehran, in Baghdad, in Damascus. So they all uh, completed the forms. Um, this amount of contribution and eagerness from the region to share their works and vision with the English speaking community amazed me. Uh, and I'm very much grateful to that. I had to pause this project for about two months because I was relocating to Washington DC for my new job at the University of Maryland. But my team and I have resumed working on the entries and images. Right now we are uploading the materials to the website and soon uh, hopefully you will hear the news of its launch. Um, that was part of my research. Then um, talking about continuing my um, you know, research on um, political theater in Iran, at the University of Maryland, I had the privilege of uh, designing and teaching a new course, uh, Activist and Critical Art in Contemporary Iran. At the core of the course, we examine Iranian artists, including Iranian theater practitioners, uh, and their ceaseless hope for a better future, no matter what. You know? The intellectual journey that uh, the course has offered um, helps me explore once again the concepts and practices of activism and arts capacity for, for world making. I personally believe that this big pause during the pandemic could function like a U-turn in our life. Um, you know, when we do U-turn, we turn our back, we have the chance to turn our back to our future and um, look, um, look back to the past and present, you know, to look back um, on our failures and the injustices of the past. So um, I continued my, of course, conversation and connection with the Iranian artists throughout different you know, social media and different platforms. Um, and I do see in this you know, chaotic pause reasons for great optimism, for at least failing better, you know, um, and for envisioning a theater and research about theater that could be in service to the community. Um, I do personally like to see the theater to assume or regain, you know, uh, and also research about theater to uh, assume and regain the role of showing us how to do this youth and in life, you know, at the time of crisis. Um, and this, of course, happens through, you know, deep questioning, enabling ourselves, our readers, our students to deep questioning and embracing this uncertainty. Um, about what I was not able to do, um, I was planning to stage a one act play written by Dr. Amila Azraki from the University of Waterloo about the representation of Middle Easterners on uh, the North American stage. It's a play based on the life story of an Iraqi actor who has immigrated to Canada. Uh, well, the project uh, failed. I mean, failed in a sense that I was not able, of course, to you know, do the rehearsal and realize it on the stage. Uh, with Dr. Amir and Azraki, I was also organizing a workshop uh, using um, forum theater and uh, um, techniques of the opera theater. We had a long list of participants from, you know, University of Toronto, York University. Uh, the workshop was canceled too. Um, also, my photo exhibition on the Middle Eastern theater was going to be, you know, to be showcased at the University of Maryland. Um, it stayed home and the display boards, you know, remain in the storage box. But many things also, as I said, began to happen. The digital guide that I initiated and um, my uh, move to the, to the States and starting this new, you know, intellectual exploration with my students. Um, and also, you know, 
this uh, this round table. I mean, this is possible through this fast digitization of our you know everyday life. And I'm here 900 kilometers away from Ottawa, <laughs> um, sharing my thoughts with you. So about the question that I have, should I ask the question now or leave it? Okay. Um, yeah, you can definitely you know, uh, ask the question, you know, so, uh, but you know, we will collect them and revisit them afterwards for sure, for sure, yeah. Okay. Well, my question actually uh, goes back to the vision that I, I would like to share with you if I have time. Um, I have been reading about Edward Said's notion of cosmopolitan humanism, you know, which I believe is the most significant legacy for us during uh, this global pandemic. Uh, cosmopolitan humanism enables any person like me, for instance, who is an immigrant and is living between two words, actually three words, in multiple cities, to live with a sort of cosmopolitan ease. You know? So I agree with Said that practicing this cosmopolitan ease empowers us to expand our political and our, polit and our ethical imagination and expand our um, ability to be in the service of our community. Um, and my optimism also is related to that, that cosmopolitan ease. My question is, um, what do our community, uh, and by our community, I mean our academic community, our artistic community, the subject that we are studying, the artists you know, that we are studying, our readers, what do they need? And how can we um, help them, enable them to do the U-turn and uh, develop their capacity for you know, living with this cosmopolitan ease? Thank you. Well, thank you, Marjan, so much for this. Um, and uh, for a couple of things you said, you know, specifically, you know, so is this, um, you, you, you so wonderfully uh, put together, you know, so the optimism and the need for pause and rethinking, you know, so um, I think that we're all um, lacking specifically in optimism, you know, like naturally, it, uh, but I also think that it's absolutely, uh, necessary, uh, essential to remind ourselves, you know, why we're doing this, for what we're doing this, and for the need of the intellectual um, discussion. Um, well, thank you for bringing cosmopolitanism and Said into that, you know, I, I didn't plan to do that, but I'm going to do this, I'm going to do shameful self-promotion, I just published a book with the word cosmopolitanism in that, yeah, <laughs> so which, uh, it's particularly interesting, you know, for me. Thanks for bringing this. And the other thing, which is also, I think, very, very important, and I think we will go back to this, you know, is actually um, the connection between the pedagogy and research and how during this time it really uh, has become much more pronounced, much more clear, you know, um, like I already heard it from Nicole, I hear it from you, I know it in my own uh, practice as well. So um, yeah, for sure, you know, so thanks for sharing this, you know. Um, and now I would like to invite uh, Professor Siwan Liu uh, to um, share his experiences, you know, and tell us, you know, what's happening in Vancouver. Thank you. Thank you, Yana, for inviting me to this um, forum. And it's really great to hear from Nicole and Majan about research, really wonderful projects. Um, and congratulations, Majan, for the uh, uh, later topic article. Yeah. Uh, so for me, uh, my research is basically about Chinese theater in the 20th century, um, the both traditional and modern theater. Um, modern in the sense of the modern Western oriented spoken drama. Um, so um, I've been, uh, there's kind of three projects that's going on right now. Uh, one is that I just um, finished um, and the, the, there's a book that's coming up next year in the, from Michigan. Um, it's about reform of traditional theater in China in 1950s and early 60s. So right after 1949, the communists take over till before the Cultural Revolution, right? Uh, so it's a look at how, how things change. It's kind of the um, systematic study um, of the change. Um, um, so that's coming up. Um, I just saw the, uh, got an email about the, the, the proof, um, not proof, not yet, copy edit um, 
in this stage. So um, the, what I'm right, working right now is basically about uh, the impact of Euro-American educated theater artists in the 1920s and 30s who came back to China and their impact on modern Chinese theater. Um, that's been going on. And then the third project I just submitted a grant proposal for is about actually the impact of Japanese avant-garde proletarian, avant-garde and proletarian theater in the 19, late 1920s and early 60s, 30s on um, China's turn to this, um, especially in Shanghai and other places, um, to proletarian avant-garde theater. Uh, so so we'll, we'll see about that. Uh, so that's my very brief description of my uh, research projects. Um, in terms of yes and no's um, about what uh, the pandemic has affected uh, of my research, uh, let me start with the no's. Um, there are several of them. Um, this one, is, of course, it's uh, Nicole has pointed out, there's no travel to archives. Uh, my research depends very heavily on, on, on archival research. Um, so I was planning on uh, this past summer uh, to go to um, uh, Yale, uh, Harvard, uh, and Carnegie Mellon uh, because of some of the students studied there uh, in, in the 20s and 30s. Uh, so that's, that's impossible. And then also from some Europe. Um, so so that, 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 that's, um, so I couldn't do that. Um, and then, um, so uh, some delayed, another one is that some delayed projects are quite interesting. I, <laughs> I, I think I'm among quite a few people that I really depend on deadlines to get things done. Uh, so, so there was, for example, canceled um, a conference um, in May about the, um, the uh, Asian Canadian Theater Conference. Um, in Toronto, um, I was hoping to write a article about a project I kind of helped start it. Is actually a, a, a contemporary adaptation of a classical, uh, classic Chinese modern theater spoken drama play called Sunrise by Cao Yu, and then uh, Major Chen um, adapted to Lady Sunrise and got produced uh, eventually uh, this February, this past February in at the uh, Factory Theater in Toronto, uh, directed by Inaki Aquino. I got to see it, I got to interview um, uh, Mina and then was going to talk to, uh, uh, to Marjorie, I saw her there. And then of course there was the, 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 the clamping down of everything uh, in March and so got the delay. And so, so I was then I kind of sidetracked to other things. Hopefully um, they're thinking about doing it again next year. So, so I need to get that started. Um, and then the third uh, no is of course, is the resources, uh, especially books. Uh, books are a big issue. Uh, online articles, journals, articles are fine. Uh, there's no interlibrary loan. There's very limited library access. And I couldn't go to, back to China this past summer, actually. That's when those annual trips is actually a big item for me to restock my, my books. Um, so, so those are the things uh, that's, that's made kind of very difficult during the pandemic. On the other hand, there are also some, some, some benefits. Actually, I found myself quite productive um, this past summer. And as a result, <laughs> number one, actually, for the, thanks to the, to the canceled conferences is one thing, actually, it's just no travel or already, already going to the archives. So I found myself actually focusing on what I have. Um, and, and, and number one, got the manuscript done and sent it out. Uh, uh, number two, um, um, did a uh, again the 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 the, um, inter, the Euro American influence art um, it, subject uh, topic? I actually was able to actually work on what I had last summer from uh, the English British trip in the British Library and National Theatre Archives. Uh, was able to to write an article about the, actually the the influence of Michel Saint Denis. Um, London Theatre Studio, uh, um, um, one of the very famous uh, directors in China and was able to present it at the uh, uh, an online conference um, in October and that was going to be developed into a book chapter. So that was 
Very nice. So, so, so deadlines, new deadlines do work. <laughs> and we, I, so I hope there at least if you are not going to do conferences, online conferences are going. And another one, of course, the grant proposal, I was also about that Japanese project I was talking about earlier. I, I uh, developed uh, from my uh, earlier conference paper into a, uh, a grant proposal and we'll see how that goes. Um, uh, second, yes, is I was able to find some online, new online sources, especially there's this one um, um, database that's Chinese books. I know it's there from our library. Uh, I just didn't use it that much. Now I find actually you can find ways to actually to, 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 to ask for, for, for different chapters, selected chapters, and it's kind of cumbersome, but it's doable. Uh, so, um, yeah, so what I can do, right? To do whatever is available, use whatever available. Um, so, um, yeah, um, and, and deadlines and then whatever conferences are available. So, um, so my question is, I'm really eager to learn whatever people's tips about doing more research about resources, um, books, uh, whatever uh, tips. Um, so hopefully things will open up by next summer. Uh, otherwise we, yeah, uh, kind of not sure. So, okay, that, that, that's my spiel. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you, you so, so much, Siwan. Um, again, you know, so you really touched on things, you know, which are essential, right? You know, so what uh, for everybody and what we do. And I don't know if we have students, you know, in this, um, um, you know, on the Zoom call today, you know, so I did ask, I did tell my students, you know, to join, don't see them here. But anyway, so I, I wish, you know, they would, you know, listen to this, you know, later, because this idea what you talked about deadlines, and how we're programmed, you know, to write for the deadlines, you know, for um, some kind of expectations, and it's how we are dependent on external motivations, the grants, and all of this, you know. So, I think it's very important to remember that it's kind of part of the game, um, and I think it's remembering you know, not and and for us, you know, who are in the sort of community service positions, whatever, which Nicole talked about, you know, so. Um, you know, having conferences, you know, continuing with organization, I think very, very important, you know, so it's part of this game, right, you know, so you write because you have a deadline, but you need the deadline because, you know, like, it, it's maybe a, a false kind of, you know, dichotomy, but I think it's kind of part of what we do, and um, maybe we have to rethink it, but I think it's part of it, and, and, and we really do that. And the other thing, which is also interesting, you know, like you and Nicole talked about archives and limitations of being able to get your data that comes from the archive, you know, so, and books, you know, and resources, you know, so somewhere else, you know, in my particular research, you know, so my data comes from watching performances, you know, because I work on contemporary performance, you know, so, and my projects are directly depend, you know, on, you know, the amount of things I actually see, you know, so, um, and not being able to see things like, you know, really reduced um, lots of ideas, but then pandemic, in my case, you know, so I was lucky because pandemic uh, pushed people to, to open up archives, put them on the um, internet, you know, so, and I was able to actually benefited quite a lot from certain companies who were sharing the archives. But then the question is, is it the same, right? You know, so is it the same that we um, we do? So um, yeah, so absolutely. And uh, I think we will also, the other thing that you touched upon and I think very, very important is to be flexible um, in, in accepting certain resources, you know, as part of what you do now, right? You know, so, and some of that is really anecdotal, I think, you know, so, I wouldn't ever imagine, you know, before pandemic, you know, using Instagram as a form of research, you know, as a tool of research or Twitter, you know, and now that's what I do, you know, so I follow my people on Instagram and on Twitter because that's how I get the information, you know, so um, I know it's probably not very serious, you know, that's not archival, <laughs> not, not, you know, uh, but, but I think that we kind of need to adopt 
um, whether we want it or not, you know, to uh, where we are and so on. So yeah, so thank you for those questions and statements and I'm sure we will revisit this again. Um, and finally, I'm going to Ash now, you know, so because Ash works in completely different area of research, you know, so and I'm sure the obstacles and uh, advantages are very, very different. So um, Ash, you know, your floor. Hi everyone, I'm just gonna share my screen. Um, and this is just um, to help uh, uh, as I speak too. So, um, and merci aussi à Frédéric pour faire toutes les traductions, c'est vraiment gentil. Um, so my name is Ash McCaskill. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at Revision Center for Arts and Social Justice at the University of Guelph. I'm funded by the Quebec government. I actually started my uh, postdoc on September 9th, and then it was actually nine days after my doctoral defense at Concordia University. So my work is in accessibility, critical disability studies and theater studies. Prior to the pandemic, I was living bi-provincially between Montreal, Quebec, where my partner and two cats are, and Guelph, Ontario. Um, and it was spread out 50-50. Since March, I have been permanently in Montreal and have since let go of my beautiful place in downtown Guelph. So my postdoctoral research on slowness remains the same, but has taken on an online methodological form. My original project pre-pandemic, Slow Journeys, intended to examine whether slowness can be generative for creating a meaningful rhythm in which many human communities can feel welcome. I just wanna give time for the translation. So, however, since the pandemic, I have been thinking more about slowness and critiquing it. I have now decided to develop a video podcast series called Slowpoke. The series uh, explores issues of discrimination and social justice within the context of the philosophy of slowness and the slow movement. The Slowpoke project holds conversations with Crip, queer, and Black, Indigenous, and people of color, BIPOC communities, by focusing on an exploration of the following question. What does slowness mean to you? Slowpoke investigates the less explicit, indulgent nature of slowness and the inequitable relations it causes between different human communities. This central question to Slowpoke um, explores, in what ways does slowness encourage and or harm the processes of how to be a good ancestor in relationship to and in allyship with queer, crip, and BIPOC communities? I choose to use the term good ancestor to echo um, Leila F. Saad's uh, use of the word in her book, Me and White Supremacy, in which she explores her drive to quote, become a good ancestor to help create change, facilitate healing and seed new possibilities for those who will come after she is gone. However, coming to this new idea took me months. Pre-pandemic, my body was already tired, uh, stressed and sick. Present pandemic and having a chronic illness, my body is more tired, more stressed and sicker. Rethinking my project took a lot of time and space. I did not feel confident in myself and writing a new project proposal 
um, was very hard for me. Something very important to me and everything I do is to always work in community, to privilege accessibility as the most important starting point and to be open to creating flexibility in everything I do to allow important changes. So as someone that is passionate about accessibility, I really give a lot of my work day into exploring new modes of accessibility, whether for meetings, teaching, and or how to support my own well-being. So currently, I prioritize using software that has embedded closed captions. I've been using otter.ai live notes, which is an add-on to Zoom, um, which enables a live transcription of your meeting. This supports folks that find it hard to just verbally engage. Having otter.ai or other forms of closed captions opens up accessibility to people from the autistic, deaf, and hard of hearing community. And no, uh, my talk is not sponsored by otter.ai. <laughs> um, I value spaces that my colleagues and I are working from, whether that be from our beds or at a proper desk, or even coming to meetings in PJs. One initiative that one colleague named Kayla Bess, who is a ma an amazing disability knowledge mobilization coordinator has initiated is this hashtag called hashtag soft office with capital S capital O. This is also an accessibility thing um, to capitalize the beginning of each word. Promoting her friends to share their relaxed space and cozy home work environments. This invitation has been led on Instagram stories. I'm just gonna show some pictures. So this is again on Instagram stories, which means it's an image that only shows up for a period of time and then it's off. And this is a picture actually of Kayla. And so in, in white text, it says, it's been, okay, it's been a minute, please show me your soft office. And it shows her holding a coffee mug um, and her, lap, uh, her laptop on her lap and she's actually sitting on her bed. And the invitation is cats, blankets, candles, coffee, loungewear, I want it all. Um, and she's again, inviting others to share a similar Instagram. And so this was actually from New Zealand, from a colleague of hers, showing that they're actually working from their couch at the moment and with the hashtag soft, soft office. And yay, soft office around the world. <laughs> Um, and again, this is just another one of a picture of a laptop sitting on a bed with a large window and to the left there's a whiteboard. Um, and this person is sharing that they've been working on their bed and the one of the main captions as well. Wow, I didn't even know you lived in an apartment dream. Um, and then thanking Kayla. <sighs> so breaks, <laughs> deep breath. I'm trying to take them as they come. As much as I try to set, have a set schedule, I have never been this linear timed worker. I work when I can, as I can, being self-aware of my constant fatigue. I try to hold space for others when I have the capacity to. My collaborator and dear friend, Jessica Watkin, always reminds me that we have to thank ourselves each day to tell your body, thank you for trying, even when you feel it's the most unproductive day. Something I am really grappling during this time is I'm mourning the loss of being with people, doing research and attending events. I'm used to being at a cafe, a cafe nomad, working from cafes, listening to my music, sitting, uh, sipping my cappuccino and working from multiple locations. Um, I find it incredibly hard um, to be in one space 24 seven. Um, I know this is what it is right now, but I also find it incredibly difficult to imagine all future educational experiences and research to be strictly online. I'm also anxious for the future as someone that does not have any promised permanent position in the near future. Through all of this, I think we are setting new legacies of how to practice academia, how to support our research communities, 
we have to be critical of how we work in relationship with decolonization and anti-racism to be good ancestors. So my question to my fellow panelists is, what um, promising practices are you currently and or would you like to incorporate in your current online activities to support um, these movements? And that's, uh, that's the end of my thought. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ash, you know, of, um, you know, of this um, walk, you know, and bringing um, back, you know, so the conversation that we actually started, you know, so was Nicole's talk um, about the um, management of time, management of care, you know, management of resources, you know, so, and I love this idea of slow poke movement. Um, I don't know if I can participate in that because I'm, I'm, I'm just too rushed all the time, you know, so that's my nature. I need to do things quickly, you know, but I love it, you know, so I mean, and probably I should learn, you know, from, from it more. Um, thank you so much to all, you know, so we're going to discuss, you know, the open the discussion, you know, so uh, first I would um, invite the participants, you know, to pick up any question, you know, so uh, they feel like, you know, jumping in and then, you know, we will open it up to the floor, you know, so and um, of course, you know, we have um, a, you know, a group of people, you know, that all do have different um, issues and practices of research, you know, so, and um, I'm, I'm happy to hear uh, from everybody around the table. Um, God, I said the table, yes, around the Zoom table. <laughs> um, I, I miss the table, I miss the social, you know, uh, aspect as well. Um, so, um, would anybody, Nicole, uh, Siwan, Marjan, you know, uh, Ash, uh, like to pick up? Siwan, yes, please go ahead. Yeah, I just, uh, about Nicole's question about avoiding service during a leave, Right. I just saw an email from a, a colleague. I sent out an email yesterday and then she came back me the, the auto uh, email saying, thank you for your email. I'm on leave, on Sunday's leave. And she laid out very clear rules that what she will not do. Um, for, 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 for reference seekers letters, uh, I will continue, I'll finish whatever I promised. Uh, uh, otherwise, please wait till I come back. Uh, for manuscript um, uh, 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 review request, uh, thank you. Please think of me after I come back. Uh, and so, so, so I think these just laying out clear boundaries is I, I never thought of it that way. It's just something that struck me as quite interesting. Um, mm. Yeah, I don't know if it fits all of us, but it's just mm. a thought. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think that the on the question of service, you know, so it's uh, I love this, you know, so you, you <laughs> set priorities and boundaries. Um, I think it's very difficult and, you know, to say no to the service um, because we are all in this game of career building and this and I understand mostly you now for younger scholars, you know, people who are looking for jobs or at the beginning of their career, they really pushed in a situation that they kind of, they, they feel they cannot say no to this, right? You know, because it's kind of connected, you know, to your service and research. So you kind of want to perform. It's, it's this um, vicious circle, right? You know, so of uh, building the career. But I agree, you know, with the point of that email that you also need to be very carefully um, watching out, you know, for your space, for your research space, because without that, um, either in terms of your personal feeling, I think, you know, your personal, um, yeah, like, you know, so satisfaction, uh, you can't move on in other areas. I think research is the lagoon, you know, that um, helps us and nourishes us, you know, in other areas, you know, so, yeah, so, but Nicole, you probably had something else. Um, yeah. Um, I find that the reason that I'm taking so much service is to support more precarious uh, colleagues because, for example, if I'd taken the leave from the presidency of Lesquiet while I was on sabbatical, then uh, my, wife's, my vice president and my treasurer and my uh, secretary don't have tenure track jobs. And so for me, it was an act of uh, solidarity for colleagues who are in a more precarious position than I am. 
and I've seen I've seen the um, responses uh, like you were talking about C1 um, where people lay out very specifically what they what they will do and what they won't do. Um, maybe the problem is I don't I don't know what I won't do until I see the the new request <laughs> coming in and then I'm like, oh no, another thing. <laughs> Yeah, and, and then trying to fit it into my schedule or not fit it into my schedule. And and I think I'm at the point now where I have enough on my schedule and I'm and if it just doesn't fit in, into my schedule, I, I'm in a better place to say no now because I, I do try to schedule my research into my schedule into my week. Uh, I, I do have um, these appointments with my research that I I try to keep at all costs and that I will guard very jealously. And uh, and so maybe I, I respond on a more ident individualized basis uh, to uh, requests for service now. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, I, I would like to jump on this as well, you know, so it's um, kind of, you know, we always talk about time management, right? You know, when it comes to academic life and so on, you know, so, and I think that again, very important for students, you know, would like to remind, you know, them about this, you know, but I do think I agree 100%, you know, that it is our responsibility, it's our, should be our form of self-care, actually build those appointments with your research into your schedule, because it's very easy to fill out, you know, your, your life, whether you're on sabbatical, you're teaching, you know, with all sorts of other Zoom meetings, you know, and uh, we're all social beings, we like to be with people, but I also think that it's absolutely essential to keep those appointments. Uh, I'm taking notes, you know, so yeah, I will do that. <laughs> sure, and would encourage other people as well. Um, yeah, um, do we have other thoughts on this, you know? Uh, I know that we have lots of um, people around this table, you know, who kind of run, you know, with service more than anything else, you know, um, and so on. I think that's what I did too when I was on sabbatical. It's basically, yeah, I mean, some, I, I, I said sorry up to some committee commitments, but basically when students ask you to, to write reference letters, it's just really hard to say no. Yeah, it's, I mean, how can you? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, this is Nash speaking. Um, I it's hard to like you know. So I guess I'm the only um, like like person that doesn't have a permanent position um, on the panel today. Um, and as someone that's also like was just a graduate student not too long ago, um, it's really hard to also like yes, boundaries are so important. Even in my email, there's an actual reply that says I will not, but I like I won't do things on weekends, but I still do. <laughs> Um, and so I think it's really hard because um, it's all about comfort level. Like, who do you feel comfortable saying no to? And I feel like a lot of graduate students are really taken advantage of because there's this assumption that because we don't have a permanent position too, that we have all of this extra time, which we don't. A lot of us are actually working like multiple part-time positions. Um, and then we're asked to do service work. Right. And then it's like, well, no problem. I mean, I, I can speak for myself. Like, um, you know, I def sometimes I unfortunately put myself a bit in that position, but at the same time, no one has ever stopped me, <laughs> you know? And I just think that there should be a recognition of like, who are we asking that extra labor from? Because if we're asking that extra labor from people that aren't, do not have that secure jobs, and that are literally like surviving sometimes just to find, put food on the table, even though they are a, a funded PhD student. And even that funding doesn't really provide everything that we need. Um, it's tough. I mean, I can, I, I'm okay saying how much I make. I only, so I get um, 55,000 from the go Quebec government and I have to deduct a whole bunch for taxes for that. And I'm only limited. I can only work so much. And that's still, that's way more than what I ever made, right? And then on top of that, I have to do service work and then it's like, will that really matter on my CV? But at the same time, I also do it because like Nicole, I'm also really interested in, in working in community and supporting the people that I work with and thinking through accessibility. So I just, there's some perspectives that I think we just really need to ask us, who's the service work that we're asking them? Because often it's also, you know, community consultants, which should be paid, right? So people from um, the Black Lives Matter movement, people with disabilities asking for consulting work. So these are, I think we need to start thinking about 
you know, service work and canceling it to we need to find making sure that people are pay, in paid positions, which I think that's why I love what Nicole's um, um, perspective of, of the way she supports. But I also recognize how um, quickly and tiring faculty members can be as well, because that's also a lot of pressure. That's the end of my thought. Do we have anybody else who would like to add on this? Um, you know, um, maybe. No, I think that from my experience, because I've been doing a lot of community service or something, you know. So um, I think that what I think is possible, you know, when you are in a situation of precarity, you know, when you kind of have to do this because we just you just named all of this, you know. So I think that. The question is, uh, like, you know, maybe, you know, like, how do you make your choices, right? You know, so what kind of community work you pick up and whether, you know, this uh, work that you're going to do might be helpful for your own growth, you know, in terms of your research, again, you know, in terms of what you might be learning, you know, so who you might be getting in touch, you know, so like, you know, yeah, it's, 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 it's not good, you know, that people are asked to work, you know, this hard, you know, so in, in the positions of the younger, you know, or like when you are at the university and all of a sudden you have to run 35 committees, we all know that, you know, so, so the question to me was always personal question, what do I learn, right, you know, so what do I learn from this and how do I expand my knowledge on something that I probably don't know and how do I turn it into something that might be helpful either in my class or in my writing, you know, so, and I really would like to go back to this um, so symbiotic relationships between the pedagogy and the class and, and what we do, you know, so and maybe kind of thinking of how much working in the pandemic, you know, so informed what we teach, right, you know, so uh, if that's possible, you know, so kind of going to back to what Marjan was saying, yeah, so the, the, would someone like to pick up on this? Um, you know, the research versus pedagogy and research versus community service and how they all connected. If I may add, I mean, I know that I brought up the topic, but um, I see doing services as, um, as an opportunity for learning and expanding my network, you know? And um, a chance that I, as I said, to put in practice my cosmopolitan ease, you know, the, the, this practicing um, um, the, the, the variety of encounters, you know, that the service and doing service um, bring for me um, and trying to um, empower my students and those who are, you know, scholarly, and also academically in the same level of mine and uh, to empower each other, you know, to um, discover our capacities and put into practice that inclusiveness that also Ash mentioned in, at the end of her statement. Yeah. Well, if, yes, please go ahead, Sivan, yeah. Yeah, uh, I second this idea of research as learning opportunities. Um, it's through the, I, I mean, I've served as editor of Asian Theater Journal for four or five years, and I've really learned so much um, from Maja and other writers and contributors. Um, it's, it's, it's something that, I mean, I mean, it takes a lot of my time, uh, but it's something that I would never uh, know uh, without being able to see all of these things. Uh, another opportunity is that I was a part of the uh, ASTR, the American Society of Theater Researchers, um, uh, on my um, publication summer forums. And I was, I hosted the Pacific Northwest uh, Forum. And it's, and then we just had a kind of uh, post-mortem about the, 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 all the forums, uh, the, the, the hosts. It's just, amazing to see how people, how genuinely people were willing to help and how much people think that we as hosts, as mentors and how much we learn from our mentees. Mm -hmm. uh, it's all the exciting new projects that's coming up, the, the pipeline, the trend of the field. And, and so it's, it's, it, I think it's, it's, I was I felt really touched uh, to be part of that group. Um. 
you can add, you know, you uh, can either raise your electronic hand or you can, uh, you know, put something into chat, you know, so um, because I, I'm not sure if I see all, um, you know, can see all people right away. Um, so there is a, 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 a chat, uh, a, there's a note from Sarah, Sarah uh, Beijing, you know, so um, in the chat, but I think she just left. Um, it's about the resources uh, that, um, that, that we were talked about, about the uh, problems, you know, uh, with uh, finding resources online. Um, so I'm not sure uh, if you can access them, you know, from, the, um, from your computers. Um, I can ask her maybe to share it later, you know, but um, yeah. Okay, so um, Ash, uh, that's a good question. I think that the electronic hand is in the participant participant section. Uh, yeah, that's okay, you know, so, and uh, there's this little button called more, so you can see all sorts of things there, you know, so you can tell us if you like or dislike things, so, you know, you can clap as well, yeah, so it should be there, yeah, okay, so, um, yeah, so I would uh, invite people to check, you know, the, um, um, you know, so this link, you know, that Sarah left, you know, so uh, unfortunately we didn't, I didn't have a chance to ask her more about that, you know, so, um, okay, um, all right. Um, does anybody else have a, an idea about the resources, you know, how do we use um, internet maybe, or how do we use, um, so uh, as a means, you know, of doing research, you know, today, if libraries are clo uh, closed and if we have difficulties, you know, accessing s certain um, forums and, and books and, and stuff. Yes, Nicole, please. Uh, I don't know if this exists in English as well, but in French, there's the Bibliothèque Solidaire. There's a, a, a library of solidarity that's like on multiple social media and that people can access. They can ask for several resources. If, if someone has a PDF of something out there, then uh, oftentimes they'll get it sent to them privately. Uh, it's unclear whether this is uh, in line with uh, copyright issues, but, uh, but it exists uh, since, uh, since March. So I don't know if someone else knows if this exists in English as well. I don't know that maybe, maybe you can put it uh, in the chat, you know, so just for people to, uh, to see you know, and so on. Um, yeah, I, I know that, you know, uh, people who work in um, certain areas and certain countries, like, you know, in my context would be Russia, like, I know, like in China, you know, so there are those other resources, you know, so which are very particular to the countries, you know, so, and that's always, you know, interesting way i find it very interesting what you can find you know through the russian um channels you know and what's sort of in a semi-public kind of you know domain what's not you know so yeah so you all of a sudden you know i feel i felt for a moment you know like i'm in back in 97 you know before the internet when i had to use all my resources and all my friends you know <laughs> and all the private channels you know to get information as much as i could yeah yeah Yes. Yes, Ash. Please go ahead. Uh, and this is Ash speaking. Apologies. I I still don't see the hand. I know I usually use it, so I, I don't know if it's just me. But so I'll just I'll just raise my hand for now. So I just apologize. Um, yeah, I think this is also a really great question. Going back to like what I was saying about I think how academia is changing. I think that there's more people that are actually sharing their articles on social media, um, which sometimes it's breaking the rules, which I'm all about. <laughs> um, uh, especially, um, there's a lot of people from the blind community sometimes that will ask for a specific article because it's only available in text form um, at a library. Um, but still, it's it's also kind of like, you know, going back to like, well, how are we finding these articles? Um, uh, something that a lot of people have been doing is creating like um, Google groups, if you will, and uploading articles that are like specific to the field that they're a part of. Um, and so, I, and I think going back to one of the great points that Nicole said about even just like having a writing cafe, which I love that. Thank you, Nicole. Um, having that as a, like a knowledge sharing, if you will, um, platform. 
But I think this is a really good point. And I almost would invite people to actually like share some of their articles that they have um, online in ways that are, you know, open to others, because I think this is going to be a problem. And this is why a lot of people like myself that don't get an academic job um, long term are feel like they can't continue to be in academia. Like, I don't think it's just a pandemic thing. So I think it's a really great point about like, how are we making these articles accessible and allowing people to have an academic practice, even when they're not necessarily affiliated with a, with a, um, an institution. And so, I, but I do think online, there's been a lot of opportunities and, but it's always asking me for, for very specific articles um, and like people finding those PDFs and sending them to them in like in covert ways. Um, so that's something that I've experienced Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, I put in, in chat, I'm sure you people know, but um, Academia Edu as a very interesting and very rich resource of things, you know, so, um, and it's, I, I have been using that, well, I do put my things, you know, there, you know, so because I, I absolutely agree, you know, so the <laughs> academic articles need to be in open format, you know, so, and it's really embarrassing, you know, when your book costs two hundred fifty dollars, you know, and you're just like, no, I mean, no, please take it for free, you know, <laughs> just take it. You know? um, so yeah, so so that might be useful resource as well, yeah, for sure. Um, um, do we have any other thoughts and concerns about this? You know, um, yes, Ash, go ahead. Um, this is Ash speaking. I'm also thinking like a lot of people have also like kind of going back to what Yana you were saying about some of the things you're starting to privilege in your research, which is like Instagram. Like I think there's some really great articles that have been sent that are like non academic publications that we can start valuing a bit more, even though they're not like a formal kind of scholarship, if you will. But I think these are also ways that maybe we're going to start to think through about how we we understand knowledge and value knowledge. Um, and um, so I just wanted to say that too, like maybe it's also about rethinking about what type of articles we're valuing um, and um, and how we're using them. Yeah, well, I, I agree, you know, so the, I, uh, my <laughs> note, uh, comment about Instagram was more like a joke, you know, but it's not actually, you know, so uh, it was more, um, you know, like usually, you know, I would go to whatever theater company, you know, somewhere, you know, and ask for an interview and maybe, you know, meet, you know, the artistic director, maybe managing company, and it's impossible to do now. So I just follow my people, you know, on Instagram. And sometimes, and you do ask a question, you know, so like, you know, so that posting of the artistic director of X company about what he just had for dinner, how valuable it is, you know, for my research, you know, you, you have this. But um, in general, you know, yes, of course, you know, so if people, the, the, the ways, you know, how the, cha the writing cha changes, you know, so it, it will be part of what we do, of course, you know, so re-evaluating re that, you know, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you have other people, you know, who would like to share these ideas about changing research practices, you know, online, you know, so re-evaluating resources, you know, and uh, what do we do with that? Um, I may hop in to, and I see that there's a question for me, Nicole's um, asking about how uh, I'm making my resources, I mean, you know, not my resources, the resources available. But here is the thing about Irania theater, and I'm um, pretty sure that it's very similar to, um, the theater of the region, it is heavily undocumented, unfortunately. That's why that this digital project is focusing on the performances that are produced after 2000. So in terms of having a very well-organized, well-maintained archive, we always have issues. And perhaps one of the reasons that I have received so many eager, so much eagerness and generosity from the artists in the region um, is that they really want to contribute to something that is archiving their work properly, you know. Um, with the, I mean, I'm also hoping that from now on, as Ash, what you are saying, that what are we leaving for our, I mean, as ancestors, what are we leaving for the next generations? I uh, am hoping that these digital archives could be something that, you know, um, will uh, appear to be helpful for 
the um, next generations. The other thing is that talking about again Iranian context, there's um, the issue of copyright is almost solved. You know, so artists are always um, helpful and kind and generous to share the videos of their productions with me through you know online uh, channels. And uh, or I've been lucky, and I also benefited from, as I said, their generosity. Um, so they share their um, works, their play scripts, and um, the video of the production with me. It's also the matter of trust, you know. And I have been working on it for years. It's not. It doesn't matter, in a, you know. Um, you know, over a night, uh, and. Um, so it's all about establishing the trust with your subject matter. I guess, again, it goes back to my vision in doing research that who is benefiting from this research. Um, my subject matter, the artist must also benefit from the research that I'm doing. And if they see that this is reciprocal, it's not that I'm always getting something from them. I'm also recognizing their vision and their um, practices. So they're helpful to you know, share their um, works with me. Um, so yeah, in, in that sense, uh, I have been both lucky and also just very hard working in um, doing, in creating the resources. Yeah. But my focus is contemporary theater, you know? Yeah, sure. And I find, I find the artists. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, that's really, you know, like we're a very small group and I, I really would like to hear, you know, from people around the Zoom call, you know, so what, what your practices are, you know, so uh, please don't be shy, you know, jump in, you know, at any point, you know, so... Um, yeah, so we, we definitely don't want to keep these conversations just to ourselves, right, you know, so, um, and so on. Um, yeah, so going back to this question of trust, right, you know, so it's very interesting, you know, so um, how do you, um, yeah, like, you know, how do you do this, you know, during the time of internet, right, you know, so because like we're all talking about social proximity, right, you know, and the ability to understand like body language and see how people react if you're taking an interview. Um, how do you do it over the internet? How do you talk to someone you don't know, um, you know, over the internet, you know, so over Zoom, you know, so can you actually do it, you know, so would they talk to you, you know, so there's this whole question of asking, um, yeah, taking interviews and so on, you know, just all of a sudden became very, very different, you know, so on. Um, does anybody else, you know, have um, thoughts on this, you know, and would like to jump on this question? Yes, Ash, please jump in. Um, so that was one of the reasons why I decided to do the podcast. Um, mm -hmm. And this actually was uh, when I was thinking through, I was, I'm still on slowness, but my supervisor, Dr. Carla Rice, invited the idea of how can we do research interviews that can be public? Mm -hmm. um, how can they just not be just curated by us, you know, and only being certain quotes come up, but how can we create those research interviews to be um, public? Um, and how can that be a form of and thinking through exactly what Marjan has been saying about, you know, how can we share that? How can it be something that we can share online um, and in ways that are accessible? So for me, something that's been really important is not just a podcast, but a video podcast. So that has closed captions and that is accessible for maybe folks that are, you know, non-English speakers or also people that are from the hard of hearing and deaf community. Again, it's a question, it's something that I'm exploring, but again, it's like, how can we create the research to have more of a public um, thing? But again, it goes back to trust. And I really want to echo what Marjan was just saying is how are we working in relationship with people that are on the conditions of what, like someone um, just in the chat was saying, um, Amir was saying that even um, Arab, uh, Arab theater, there's copyright issues. So these are things to condition to consider. It's like, how are we being in relationship with the people that we want to do research with and for, but how are we doing it in conditions that are, they're comfortable with? And that goes back to thinking through, working with them to think through that research. So it's not really research subjects, but maybe it's research partnerships um, mm -hmm. that we need to be more thinking about. And that's the end of my thought. Yeah. 
Well, it, it, to me, you know, it actually uh, goes back to something very interesting that came up in my research very recently. Never, I didn't think it, I would ever ask this question, you know. So um, I'm focusing on an artist from Russia who has been under the very close radar of the of the government, right? You know, so and was under the home arrest for a year, you know, then the public trial and so on. So the question is, and this is actually more for Siwan, maybe, you know, because maybe you can connect to this and for Marjan, actually. So how do you publish things in English in a such a way that, that you don't harm your subject back at home? Um, so, and it's, it's really very recent, you know, so I didn't think about it that much because, um, uh, so I, I'm curious, you know, how do you do that, you know, so where do you do, draw the line? At what point you say, no, even in English, this might be too, like, I might be thinking, right, you know, I might be really thinking like great insights, you know, but it might be harmful for my artist. I don't know, Nicole, if you have similar thoughts, you know, crossing your mind, but I'm really curious about Siwan and Marjan's thoughts about this. Siwan, do you want to do you want to jump in or? Um, I I can I can go first. Um, this is a very very important question, and I'm glad that you brought up. Uh, this is the question that, I mean, my very first question when I started doing my research as an MA student in Toronto, that, um, as I said, who is benefiting from my research and how am I going to protect the life of the artist that I'm writing? Because I was particularly writing about their resistive techniques, you know, mm -hmm. um, and um, the kind of um, their uh, practices of putting political questions into perspective. Um, the most practical thing that I uh, found, just talking about you know the practical aspect of the job, was just uh, play the role of a reporter, and trying to find what they said in the interviews. And you may not believe, but uh, there many of them are so outspoken in the interviews that are so helpful for me. Okay, oh thanks God, they have said that in the interview, and the interview has been published in Persian, in Persian media. So I have this license to just write in English. Th there are some cases that uh, I should admit I don't write because I'm working with living artists and the research ethics for me is very important. So I simply do not write. I, but I have a, you know, an, a, a notebook of what I will say in the future. Yeah. Yeah, uh, for me, fortunately, most of my work is not contemporary, basically. Um, there, there are topics that interview contemporary directors that's, that's more artistic. Uh, for my book, I, relied, I decided to rely exclusively on archives. Um, yeah, the, uh, there, there are people I talk to, but mostly to get this background uh, knowledge. Um, so so the, the, it's, what's coming out is just exclusively using archival source. Um, maybe I can talk about my process as well, because I um, I think ethics is maybe a bit new in theater studies. And uh, when I started doing it, uh, coming out of my PhD, when I was in my PhD, we didn't have to do it, but now we do um, when we engage with uh, people from the theater communities. And, uh, and so um, I'm finding that some of my participants are very willing to be identified for their work and some of them are, don't want to. And, uh, and so I do get all of the, the transcripts that, of the interviews that I do, I get them approved by the participants. And uh, every time I want to quote something from, uh, from that interview, I will go back to that person and ask them, uh, if it's okay to quote them and if it's okay to attribute that quote to them. And um, it's interesting because I, uh, when I wrote my book, I wrote about these very subtly uh, resistant translation moves where not everything was translated uh, for uh, hegemonic spectators. 